I'm at a very significant location. Now, directly behind me are the mountains of the country of Jordan. And also in front of those mountains is what's called the Dead Sea. South of the Dead Sea in this direction were, were five cities that existed in the time of Abraham and Lot called the five cities of the plain. They're listed in Genesis 14 as Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Abraham is a man that God raised up to form a nation that we now know as the nation of Israel and his descendants would be the Hebrew people, which were later known as the Jewish people, which is the name of the identity of the particular ethnic group that Abraham originated being the father of the nation of Israel through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons. I'm going to talk to you today, though, about a very important subject, and we're going to connect a nephew of Abraham by the name of Lot to this subject. And this subject is called Praying Your Children Out of Sodom. Now, you have to understand, first of all, before we talk about prayer and intercession, what is Sodom? Sodom was one of the chief five cities that existed south of the Dead Sea. We do not know exactly how large it was. I read many years ago in an archaeological report the suggestion that there could have been 40 to 50,000 people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And back in the time of Abraham, it's much different today, by the way, but back in the time of Abraham, the area of Sodom and Gomorrah was the area that Lot chose to dwell in with his flocks because the Bible says it was well watered like the Garden of Eden. And we do know from evidence of the southern part of the sea that there's what's called wadis or riverbeds. Some of them are dried. Some of them, uh, when the winter rains come, fill up with water. But there was a watered area in that area that made it a very desirous place to stay if you had flocks and animals. Also, this is called the Syrian African Rift where I am that goes up into the Galilee and comes all the way into the Dead Sea and all the way to Elat uh, in southern Israel. And this area was the trade route area of this part of the world. The kings, you can read about this in Genesis 14, battled in this area, uh, the Vale of Sedim or the area of the Dead Sea. And this was a very big trade route. So those cities were built in a very strategic location. The problem was, now we're, going to, we're talking about praying your children out of Sodom. The problem was the iniquity that was in that city. Now, the Bible will give you in Genesis 19, one of the very strong uh, sins that was in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, you can take the name Sodom and you can just take that word and study that word out. And it gives you the details of one of the, what Ezekiel calls abominations of the city would be the men with men, the young men with the young men, old men with the young men, etc., which is mentioned, by the way, in Genesis chapter 19. But there were, uh, there were numerous sins and different things of that nature that existed in that city. So what happened was Lot moves his entire family towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let me talk to you about Lot for a moment and compare him to Abraham and show you something very, very, very unique in my opinion. Number one, Abraham was the, a spiritual man and Lot really was not identified or known as a spiritual man, although Peter called him in his epistle, that righteous man. So he knew God and he believed in Abraham's God, but Abraham was the actual leader of what we would call the tribe or the clan. And Lot just sort of followed, fought, was a follower. Number two, notice that in the Bible, Abraham is consistently building altars throughout the promised land. He goes to Bethel, he builds an altar at Bethel, and then he revisits Bethel. He goes to Beersheba, he builds an altar there. But notice in the story where Abraham and Lot came together with their families through the promised land to settle the area, that Lot is never building an altar. Abraham is building altars, but Lot is not building altars. So what does that say about the prayer life of Lot? Now we also know when we look at Abraham and we study some of the things about Abraham, that Lot was always having to bail him out. I'm sorry, Abraham was having to bail Lot out. I mean, Lot was always getting in trouble. He is captured by the kings of um, what we call the area of Shinar, which is Babylon. Today it's Iraq and Lebanon and Syria. These kings come and invade the area. They take Lot, his entire family, and all the people and the goods of Sodom. They seize it 
and they carry it back toward their land. And Abraham had to take 318 servants on camels. I call them the hump brigade because camels have a hump on them sometimes too. That's just my little joke there. And he, he had to go and take those uh, men, his servants, and defeat those kings and bring Lot back. And this is, of course, the story of where Abraham then did something else Lot did not do. We read that Abraham not only was victorious in battle and had to fight to rescue Lot, but we see that Abraham also paid tithe to Melchizedek, which Lot, there's no record of Lot paying tithe. There's no record of Lot giving. My point is simply this. Lot gets himself into a situation where the Bible says that Abraham tells him, look at all this land and you choose the direction of where you want to go and you choose where you want to live. And of course, Lot chose the cities of the plain. And again, they're in this direction on the southern part of the Dead Sea where I'm standing right here today off the edge of the Dead Sea with the country of Jordan in the background. So Lot would have traveled this way. So he selected that land and here's the thing we read in the Bible. Lot looked toward Sodom. So here was a city that according to Ezekiel had five major sins in it, plus one sin, which was called an abomination. And we know from Genesis 19 what that was, if you'll read that. So we see that he looks toward Sodom. So he pitches his tent toward Sodom. The next thing we read about Lot, we see him inside the city of Sodom. So the first thing he does, he looks that way, then he starts moving that way, and then he ends up moving in the city. And then we later see him, and Peter tells us that Lot was vexed daily by the filthy conversation of the wicked. So here is a man who is, has a faith in the true God, but he's now moved into a city that's so perverted and so corrupt that the conversation, and in the book of Peter, where Peter mentions conversation, it actually in Greek means the deeds that the people were doing, the activity that they were involved with, is grieving this righteous man every single day. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you is many of you watching me right now have children, sons and daughters, that you raise to do the right thing, and perhaps they live in an area where they are being influenced by maybe some type of perversion, they're being influenced by some type of a spiritual bondage. They're being influenced by some type of addiction or something that has led them into alcohol addiction or even drug addiction. And so you're very concerned about them. And, and so you say to yourself, God, what am I going to do with people that have influenced my children, my bloodline, those that have my name and my DNA, but they're influencing them in the wrong direction to do wrong things and to do evil things. So what am I going to do? This is the question that I know some of you have right now that's got you very concerned about your family members. Now, one of the things I want to say to you is simply this. You have to first examine what is it that's holding back your son or daughter or grandchildren from coming to the Lord. Most of the time, it's one of these four things. Number one, they are spiritually blind. Paul talked about that the eyes of your understanding would be open to see. Now, I don't mean they're physically blind, but they are blind to the things of God and you have to pray for their eyes to be opened. So those that are spiritually blind need prayer for the eyes of their understanding to be opened. The second reason many people, family members are not saved is for this reason, they refuse to listen, meaning their ears are dull. You can give them warnings of danger. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. They hear what you say, but they're paying no attention to obey what you say. So this is where you have to pray that their ears, spiritual ears, will be open to hear the word of the Lord. You can't just expect someone that's spiritually blind and dull of spiritual hearing to automatically just receive the word that you're saying unless you pray, as Paul did, for eyes and ears to be open. And Jesus talked about the ears, okay? Now, here's something else that I want to share with you, and that is this. Many times a person's spirit is dead, and on the inside, their spirit is not responding to the things of the Holy Spirit because they are physically alive to the flesh and physically alive to sin, but they are spiritually dead in their spirit. Now, we did a teaching from Israel you're going to hear where I talked about awakening the spirit of the person through prayer. And I won't deal with that right now, but let me go to number four. 
And this is a big one. If I were to ask you, why is it that more people are not serving Jesus Christ? It is because that those who have a knowledge of true Christianity understand that there is a life of separation you live when you have become a true follower of Christ. There, for example, are things that are considered sin that you avoid when you become a follower of the Lord. So here's the number one reason I believe, and it's probably the number one weapon the enemy uses against unsafe family members, is what the Bible talks about, the pleasure of sin. Now, for those of you that don't think there's any pleasure in sin, you haven't sinned in a long time. Thank God for that. But that's what's connecting people to the lifestyle that they're in is that they get a particular feeling that they enjoy out of that which they're doing. Now, look at, look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11, 23 through 26. By faith, Moses when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, watch this now, than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. It is the pleasure of sin. If we take the blindness, not listening, their spirit being dead, it's the pleasure of sin that's connecting them to a stronghold that's holding them into their captivity where they're not following the Lord or they're not obeying the Lord or they're not being born again at this particular time because of their, what we call, pleasure sin. Now watch this because I want to give you the second thing that's very important in this study. And that is that there are feelings of sin that are attached to addictions. One is, for example, pornography addiction. One is drug addiction. Another is alcohol addiction. So these addictions bind people up and an addiction can make you numb to the conviction of the Holy Spirit because you're so deep into the bondage that you can't feel the conviction. I'm going to read a very strange verse from Proverbs chapter 23 and I want you to look at this verse. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yet you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or one who lies down on the top of the, of the mass saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. Then shall I awake that I may seek another drink. Now what this is, this is actually showing uh, what we call the power of alcoholic addiction and how the person actually in that addicted state don't even realize what happened and then they awake only to want to go back to have another drink or in some cases if it's a, a drug addiction to go back into having another fix or another high. Why? Because of two reasons. To numb them of the pain that they are experiencing in their life and number two, to, to cr the craving that the chemicals that are produced from the drug or alcohol produce, that craving of that feeling, they want it over and over again. Now, we are dealing with an addicted generation. There's no question about that. And we are dealing with people who need to be set free. So I'm going to give you some steps of things God taught me. And I want you to hear me about praying your sons and daughters out of the bondage of Sodom. And Sodom just simply represents evil. It represents addiction. It represents the flesh. It represents iniquity. So praying them out of that. All right. Number one, find a specific promise for your family in the scripture. Now here's a good one. I hope you have a pen right now. I want you to write down Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Now this was a statement that Paul made to a jailer when a jail, when the jail had shaken and God had set Paul and Silas and all the prisoners free. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. So you find that one verse, you find that verse, and in that verse, you hold on to that verse of scripture, believing God for salvation, household salvation. All right, number two, you find what I call an application verse. Now, an application verse can be this, where the verse has a first meaning or a primary meaning, but you can take that verse and apply it practically to your situation. Let me give you one. For when Zion travailed, she brought forth her children, Isaiah 66 and verse 8. Now, if you read that verse literally, it's talking about when Israel was rebirthed as a nation. 
They were born in a day. So they, the Jewish people went through the Holocaust and after the Holocaust, which was the travail, the picture of the travail here, the nation was reborn. You can take that verse, however, and apply it spiritually that when you, Zion representing the church, and when the body of Christ or the church begins to travail in the spirit, you will begin to produce children uh, that are going to be born again or people that are born again of the spirit of God and of the water baptism, meaning that our intercession is what's important. Now, this, is, this goes back to Abraham because Abraham was an intercessor. When God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham steps in and God says, I can't hide this thing from my covenant friend, Abraham. He has relatives that are living in Sodom. So I can't destroy the city and destroy his family without letting him know what I'm going to do. And so what happens is Abraham begins to intercede and starts up with 50 souls and says to God, if you find 50 souls, will you spare the city? God said, I'll spare, I'll spare it for 50 righteous people. He went to 40, 30, 20 and stopped at 10. Now the question is this, why did Abraham stop at 10 righteous people? He, topped, he stopped at 10 because you had Lot, his wife, his two virgin daughters, and you had sons-in-laws and daughters-in-law that died in the fiery destruction of Sodom. And most rabbinical scholars say there were a total of 10 people that Abraham saw when they moved toward Sodom, but Abraham did not realize, and Lot didn't either until it came time to leave the city, that over half the family, including sons-in-laws and daughters that were married to those sons-in-laws, would not was not going to come out of the city. They were going to stay there even after they received the warning of judgment. So in other words, you have to find an application. Now listen to this. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have labored. And as it were brought forth wind, we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. So in other words, there's a travail there's, there's almost like, well, I'm so concerned. I just hope they get saved. Oh, Lord, save them. And that doesn't produce anything. But then there's that heavy intercession that God hears that he intervenes with. And he pulls Lot and his wife and two daughters. And of course, you know the story how she looked back and, and, was, and was slain. But the wife and two daughters escaped the judgment because Abraham interceded for them. Don't miss that point. The angels came to deliver Lot because of Abraham's intercession. So my point is that you that have unsafe family members are going to have to learn the laws and the, and the, and the approach of spiritual deep travail, spiritual deceit, uh, deep intercession to get those, to get the breakthrough that you need. Now, I want to tell, I want to talk to you about something here. Here's another application verse that a friend of mine showed me that was phenomenal. Isaiah 40, I hope you're writing these down. Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 4. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked uh, shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now, if I'm going to take this verse as an application, then what I want to do is this. I want to first of all look at what it means to make the crooked path straight. If I'm looking at this verse to apply it to my unsafe family member, I will pray, God, make their twisted ideas and their twisted thinking, make it straight. Take away the crookedness in their thinking. Now we're talking about an application. There's a literal verse here, but I want to apply it to my situation in my family. The second thing we read here is the mountain shall be brought low. Now the, a mountain is a very high thing, which represents in the Bible strongholds. Strongholds are high things according to Paul that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So here we pray, oh God, let the mental strongholds that are contrary to the knowledge of God be brought down, break the strongholds in their mind and life. Break the strongholds and bring the strongholds down. Now, the third part of this application is found here where it says, and the valleys will be brought up. Now, a valley is a depressed place. It's a low place. And what I see as far as an application for you and I related to our family members and praying for them to be one to the Lord is that the depression and the oppression that has got them down, that we reach down with our hand and pull them up. We pray for them to be pulled up. We pray that the low places that they're in, that God will 
will help them to be, take those low places and bring them up. So the stronghold come down, comes down and the oppression and depression that presses them is removed and they are lifted up. And as they are lifted up in the presence of God, we then ask God to change and transform their lives. So the, you find a verse and you say, you know what? That verse has so much application to the situation that I'm in. Now, the fact is this, and Abraham proves this, you've got to become an intercessor. You can't just hope them in. You just can't think them in. You can't just invite them to church. You've got to go into intercession. God spoke to me and said, and I'm going to give you a few nuggets here real briefly. I did a whole teaching on this recently on praying for your prodigal sons and daughters, but I want to give you some nuggets real quick. Number one, you have to ask God, awaken their spirit. God, awaken them on the inside. Number two, you have to pray that the eyes of their understanding will be open and the dullness of their ears will be removed. The Bible calls it ears waxed dull. We're talking spiritually now. And for them to be open where they will hear the truth and they will receive understanding of the truth. And there's, there's a whole list of things here and I'm not going to have the time to get into, but I want to say this to you that when you begin to pray for people who are away from God, especially when they're, you know, they're involved in different lifestyles and involved in things that you know are wrong. One of the key points is love them unconditionally and let them know you pick up the phone and you call them and you say, I just want you to know today I'm praying for you and you can't go low enough for me not to love you. Now think about what I just said. And God spoke to me one day and he said, you know what? The devil can never hate you more that I'm able to love you. <laughs> you think about that for just a moment. Satan cannot hate you more than God is able to love you. And so if you'll express the unconditional love, pray for their eyes and ears to be opened, pray for their spirits to be awakened. You can pray your children out of the destruction that's coming and you can pray them out of the influence of what we call the influence of Sodom, which represents the world system of thinking. Now, Manifest has an offer consistently and you help keep Manifest on the air when you obtain this. Please get this. It's new. We want you to have it. And thank God for this 80 degree weather at the Dead Sea in Israel. Be back in a moment. Our new offer is one of the most important prophetic teachings in the history of Manifest. Hebrew expert Bill Cloud and I teamed up on this 10-hour teaching to unlock the mysteries concealed in Israel's seven festivals. This album has 11 DVDs that are 21 30-minute lessons. They include illustrated messages and charts and pictures to enhance the details of the research. On the first DVD, I explain God's seven appointed festivals along with God's prophetic calendar. Bill Cloud then shows you a complete Passover Seder and explains the mystery of unleavened bread, unlocking its prophetic purpose, including the revelation of the Messiah. I then follow up taking you on a journey to illustrate the prophetic layers found in the Festival of First Fruits. Bill presents the fourth festival dealing with the powerful significance of Pentecost and its impact upon us today. On DVD number six, I will explain the three fall festivals and how they are yet to be fulfilled, showing how trumpets and the different shofar sounds on that day encrypt the mystery of Christ's return for His bride and the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Then I explain the biblical and ancient temple rituals of the sixth festival, Yom Kippur, and how they detail the great tribulation judgments yet to come. On DVD number nine, see Bill Cloud set up a sukkah walking you step by step through the practical and prophetic meaning of Israel's seventh festival, also known as the Seasons of Our Joy. Among the live audience, the most talked about DVD was lesson number 10, where I examine Israel's three biblical harvest cycles that prophetically conceal the rapture, the tribulation, and the millennial kingdom through the festival harvest patterns of ancient Israel. The 11th and final DVD will stir your spirit as I reveal God's plan to restore His glory to the earth in these last days. This teaching introduces to the viewer unique Hebrew word studies, fresh biblical insight, unusual Jewish customs, and exciting prophetic truth, helping you to understand the future according to God's festival calendar. It was preached before a live audience of ministry partners, and this teaching was originally designed as a Perry Stone Bill Cloud ISO Bible course that normally is $150. 
However, right now you can receive the 11 DVDs as a limited time offer in an album for your donation of $75 or more. To order your set, go online at perrystone.org, call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD, or write the ministry and send your donation of $75 or more to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Now remember, when writing or calling, use offer number 11DVD101. Help keep manifest on the air. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I hope if you have not done it yet, this is one of your final opportunities on the program to get this is an investment in your spiritual wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And it's good to invest in things that bring you knowledge and information that's life-changing. Uh, we're going to be coming to Texas, Willis, Texas, and Huntsville, Texas. All you Texas folks, please come and, come and see me. We love you guys so much. You guys remind me of the Tennessee people, just great, down-to-earth, God-fearing, God-loving people. And bring, bring your friends with you because we're going to come with some brand new revelation from God just specifically for you in all the meeting. The other thing I want to share with you, and I want you to stay with me for just a moment while I talk about this. In every October, we have the big camp meeting. It's called the main event. And we've got, you know, uh, just so many great speakers coming this year that you're going to want to hear, plus Pam's Fall Festival, plus the Neelands are going to be at the Fall Festival, plus Karen Peck's going to open up, plus you got Lyndall Cooley. Please set aside the time to come and get refreshed. Folks, there's so much bad going on. I mean, people that come to these conferences say, oh, I'm so glad I came and I met new people. So I want to tell you that. Perry Stone Ministry Facebook page, you got to put the word ministries in there, Facebook page. And also our YouTube channel is continually growing. And we just are doing everything we can to reach the number of people that we can reach in the time that we have. We're doing lens of a camera where thousands of people are coming to know the Lord every time we do these overseas meetings with a big screen. And I preach from here over a big screen. And there's so much going on and many people being saved in Europe. Thank you. If you were converted under our ministry, send me an email. I'd love to hear your testimony. I mean, we give God, glory to God for you. See you next week. Join Perry and Pam Stone October 4th through 8th as they host the 35th annual Main Event Camp Meeting Celebration at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. This year's celebration features anointed worship from Karen Peck and New River, the Neelands, and Lyndall Cooley with powerful preaching from Perry Stone, Tony Scott, Tommy Bates, and Ron Carpenter. The celebration continues on the Omega Ranch with loads of fun for everyone at Pam's Fall Festival. This is a free event, but you must register online. Go to perrystone.org for registration and more information. Be refreshed, renewed, and recharged at the 2022 Main Event Camp Meeting Celebration. Register now. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2022 Israel Tour. The dates are November 20th through the 29th, with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.